I just flew into town and I got a few words to say about the things I've seen while I've been on my way. Cause it's all my life. I never had much to lose. I've been staying off par, keeping on cruise. And moving around the country, I call it Uncle Sam's backyard. My folks live moved to California, not just about eight years old. Yeah, we packed up a suitcase and what we didn't carry we sold. But I had a first-hand chance to dig this land. I said, when I grow up, I want to be a traveling man and do some investigating out in Uncle Sam's backyard. Now every place I go, there's people worried as can be. I hear about the nuclear power plants and all the new electricity. And that radioactive, there's a lot of bad news. There's big money chasers giving everyone the blues. And they're stirring up some trouble out in Uncle Sam's backyard. I, I came from a somewhat musical family. I, I uh, my immediate family uh, didn't have any musicians in it, but uh, my cousins and my aunts and uncles, some of them, uh, some of my uncles played music. And one of them had a professional, was a professional bass player, one of them. And, uh, and they played, my cousins played pianos and so forth. And I never really took lessons. I wanted to get, I want, actually, I, I wanted to take lessons. I wanted to learn how to play the Hawaiian pedal steel guitar when I was eight years old. That was the thing that I wanted to learn because I used to hear a country western band. That's the instrument that interested me the most, but I, um, that wasn't possible. Um, and and I don't, my folks really couldn't afford it anyway, so they were probably glad that I wasn't interested. But I, to the point of bugging them about it, I eventually learned, learned to play the harmonica myself. That was the instrument that I chose to learn because I liked folk songs and I learned folk songs. In school they taught us some songs, you know, and I used to uh, look up songs and books. And, uh, I had a teacher when I lived in California. We lived in California part of the time and moved back and forth across the country a couple of times or more than like three, 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 three times at least. But in grade school and public school I had a teacher in California who kept me after school and taught me songs because she liked uh, my singing and thought she could use me in some kind of a school Indian pageant so she was teaching me these Navajo Indian songs and I always think that was important to me and uh, they encouraged it in the public schools you know back in those days I mean I think music and art was just part of what you took in school and um, so I guess between that and and you know, my mother, when I was a kid, taught me a few songs, and, you know, there was a lot of music around. My grandparents had some records, and my father has a record collection. Um, and we had records at home, and I, got, I really got into it. I, a 45, I remember, that they had of the Weavers doing So Long, It's Been Good to Know You, the Woody Guthrie song, you know, and that was one of my favorite songs. Here's one I made up. I call it, uh, I call it If a Woman's Love Was Whiskey.
I think Paul was influenced by Brian Willie McTell, as well as a host of other of the legendary country blues guitar players. So Brian Willie McTell is the one that comes to mind because Paul plays a lot of 12-string guitar. He took that style and assimilated it into his own musical being, as it was, and created original music that some of it is blues-based, some of it isn't, but it all sounds like it comes from that source. Generally, the East Coast Piedmont players they were trying to emulate the piano sound. So when Robin Gary Davis, who was one of the great Piedmont guitar players, he would teach the guitar. He would say, well, you're playing the piano, but we're luckier because we have three hands. And the three hands being the left hand, um, which is spreading chords. Then you have the thumb of the right hand, which is like the left hand of the piano player. Then you have the index finger, which is like the right hand of the piano player. So you put them all together, you have three hands and you're trying to get that same syncopation, the same bounce that piano players were playing. I'll start off with a little My style of playing, six and twelve string guitar. I mean, it's 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 a pianistic kind of a thing. I, I I'm influenced a lot by piano music. I play piano some, but I I think it's uh, you know the right the right hand the finger style thing is an attempt to, is an attempt to uh, some has always been traditionally you know linked with the piano. I mean, I think there's a lot of some of the best country blues guitar playing is is uh, is derivative of piano playing and uh, for lots of reasons you know you could carry a guitar around and play on the streets piano players had to stay in one place I and mean, they, they didn't have a chance to go to where the crowd was and make the kind of money that guitar players and fiddle players and banjo players mm -hmm. I really remember was actually Louis Armstrong, Louis Armstrong record, but the first 
uh, country blues uh, guitar picker that I saw perform was Mississippi John Hurt. Um, and that was 1963. I heard him do uh, Stagger Lee and uh, what else was he doing? I can't remember what the other song was. I heard him do a couple of songs at a, at a workshop the last day of the Newport Folk Festival in 1963. I wanted to go the whole weekend, but I couldn't uh, manage it. And uh, that was before they had the bridge. I had to take a boat. Uh, I'd take the ferry over to Newport. And, uh, I had to work. I couldn't go there on Saturday. I, I wish I'd been there for the whole weekend. But fortunately, I got, to, I, I got there and got to hear him. And then in, the, in that year, I started really digging and found a whole lot of things. I heard, uh, I picked up some LPs, a, a thing of Scarper Blackwell and a, one of Pink Anderson, and a Jack Elliott record, one which he played Railroad Bill, Finger to Finger style. And I just listened to that over and over. And then I ran into a friend, uh, a local guy, who played guitar and used to watch him finger pick. You know, he was into Chet Atkins and that sort of thing. He was very good and I he didn't, didn't mind if I watched him play. So I got into it that way and then went up to the Club 47 that year and heard Tim Harden. I heard Tom Rush and uh, uh, I also had been listening to Dave Van Ronk. Cocaine Blues, I think, was the first thing I heard of him. I was broadcast on a radio station. And it actually gave me chills when I heard it. It was really, you know, it's really a beautiful thing, you know. And then uh, his uh, St. Louis Tickle totally blew my mind. I, I knew a gal who played guitar, and she knew a little bit of that, you know. And, and she taught me a couple of licks on that thing, and I tried to play that one. But he really uh, was really important that way. He's, he really was the first guy to really get into you know, transposing the ragtime stuff and the early jazz tunes. And uh, when I met Dave, um, it was probably late 60s. Um, um, he was doing all kinds of things, and I had a chance to see him play a bunch of times. And, uh, he, he's also a teacher. I never took lessons from him, but I mean, he, he teaches a lot of people. He's a great teacher. His style is... He's a very precise guitar player, and uh, um, I think he's one of the most important guitar players out there. In a manner of speaking. Yeah. The following year was a big year, 64. The, I, I made sure I got to the Newport Festival for that blues workshop on the Saturday afternoon. That was one of the most important things I ever experienced because that's where I heard Skip James, Sunhouse, Robert Pete Williams, Sleepy John Estes and Yank Rachel, who later I became friends with. Uh, they, they stayed in Providence for a week at a club there, and I went down to hear them every night. And, uh, Oh, man, I just, I don't know, things started rolling along there, and 64 was the big year that things started really happening, you know. Um, so that, there, was a, there was a lot going on. I happened to be in the right place at the right time, it seemed. Crap game, so there was against my will. Lost every dog on a nickel I had on a greenback dollar bill. Before it 
affected by a lot of the, the older black musicians who were re rediscovered. Every one of them I mean, affected me. They were, it was amazing to, to hear these guys. And then uh, people I really studied late also in terms of later on, um, on records. When I, when I, I mean, Sunhouse, Skip James, I got to see them up close. I met Howlin' Wolf. He showed me a little bit on the guitar, actually. Some Charlie Patton stuff that he did. Um, oh, God, so, so much stuff took place. Sleepy John and Yank Rachel, like I said, I, I really listened to them a lot. And on the records, once I was able to get my ear so that I could pick things up with records, that was a very important thing, and I learned a lot about that from a guy named uh, Mike Stewart, who was known as Backwards Sam Furk. He was a, one of these guys had really, really good ears and was very famous for picking up. He could play almost anyone's style for a couple of bars. He didn't really sing whole songs, but you know, he showed me a few tricks to learning how to pick up songs off records. That was an invaluable thing. I, and uh, once I got the knack of that, then I was then I was off and running. And, and, and even though by that time a lot of the old timers were past and gone, I was able to listen to the old records uh, as I had been, but only listen to it with an with an ear to understanding how to play it a little bit. Yeah. You know, a little bit different. You know? Yeah. And I never really got into tablature, or I never took any lessons, but. I did develop my ear, and I think, sometimes I think that I was better off for the fact that they didn't have any tablature or instruction tapes, videotapes of the stuff, you know, because I think it forced me to develop my ear and be able to pick things up, you know, and um, I was always pretty good that way anyway, but when you really want to learn something, you make sure you, you strain your ears, you know? So I think, uh, I think it, 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 st it stood me uh, well that I, that, I had, that I had to do it that way. Stretching in the morning, I got mine. of the music is a very aural, you know, thing. And the, the nuances are such that there's no way that you could notate what's going on. But if you really get to know the sound of the music, and it's funny, even without being consciously so, you can um, start to speak that language, um, so to speak. And Paul's a perfect example of somebody who does that beautifully. Like, you'll hear Paul play and you'll think, Wow, that's what I was hearing through this, all those scratches on those old 78s. He really brings it to life, whereas I think a lot of, of uh, you know, white blues players or, you know, many generations removed blues players 
they're playing their sort of impressions of the music. Even though they're trying, to, even if they're getting all the notes, they're not getting inside it. But Paul really, when you listen to him, you think, I mean, he's, he, it's, it's hard to explain unless you sit down and hear Paul. But uh, it's, it's uh, qualitatively different than other people's interpretations of some of the old blue stuff. He's really right inside that music. Steve Mann, who affected my approach, and uh, friends of mine who uh, conveyed uh, some of the things that he did to me at a certain point, because uh, he, between him and uh, Dave Van Rock, Spider John Kerner, and uh, Tim Harden, and uh, see Tom Rush, Jeff Muldaur, all those cats in Cambridge, and, and in New York, Patrick Sky, and all those people that I saw playing, I, I absorbed a lot from from what they were doing. Uh, they were a few years ahead of me. And basically, I came on the scene kind of late, and, uh, late, and I've been sort of uh, sticking with it. A lot of them just sort of uh, went off and did other things. Paul has brought something completely 
totally different to it, though. He doesn't sound like any of uh, his uh, earlier influences. He, he uses more extended lines, musical, melodic lines, in his playing, and uh, he has a, a marvelous way of breaking up his phrases into asymmetrical uh, lengths. So instead of the standard four-bar phrase, which is what you know everybody uses, his phrases will extend over uh, four bars, and sometimes he'll even he improvises quite a bit when he's playing. Sometimes he'll even carry a phrase over from one stanza to another. Uh, it's very exciting when he does that. Loves to play the 12 string guitar, and he's one of the few people alive who should be permitted to do so. Uh, he's um, a marvelous 12 string guitarist, and that, is, that instrument is a bear to play, and very few people get much out of it. Paul was living in Providence, and I was uh, going to school and playing local coffee houses a little bit. And I heard about this guy that was playing it. Somebody said, uh, oh, you got to hear this uh, guy at Rhode Island College Coffee House. He's the best blues guy I ever heard. And of course, back then, we were all young and feisty. I said, well, he just show me, you know. So I got in the car and drove out there. And sure enough, in 1965, he was the best I'd ever heard. <laughs> and uh, I went and introduced myself to him. We became friends, and that was in 35 years ago. And he doesn't get the recognition. I mean, it was beautiful when he was on the cover of that Blues Review quarterly. I mean, I was as proud as if I was on the cover. You know when you hit the mark, because you, you got to get somewhere close to where Paul is. He's the man. The first recording deal I got into came about as a result of doing a concert at the Folklore Center in New York City for Israel Young, Izzy Young. And, uh, and uh, Patrick Skye, who I had met and become friendly with over the years, you know, the pr the prior to that, um, Pat and I hit it off. We had a lot of things in common besides music. We were both into fishing and hunting. And, uh, and uh, <laughs> And uh, we just, you know, uh, I don't know, just became friends. And and he and, uh, and uh, he 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 thought that I should make a record. And I said, well, yeah, I guess maybe I should. Maybe it'd be easier to get some work, you know. And so he told Izzy Young I wanted to make a record. And Izzy said, uh, well, you know, when you do the concert, you know, there's a guy coming to tape it. He said, I, I, I and and coincidentally, he, he was having lunch with uh, Mo Mo Ash the next day. And Pat has suggested I try to make a record for Folkways, you know. So he said, uh, why not try Folkways? I said, well, if they'd be interested or not, okay, you know. So so Izzy tape, took the tape and gave it to Moe Mo, Mo Ash. And Mo, Mo said, yeah, okay. And so I got a call from And Pat wanted to produce a record. He, wanted, he, he prided himself as being a record producer, which, you know, which he was actually he's pretty good at it, you know. But he was, this was, the, I think this is the first thing he ever tried. And uh, it, it worked out okay, you know. And Pat called me up, and I got down to New York and recorded it in a studio. And it was it was a lot of fun. And uh, I like to make records, and I, you know, that was the first one I did. And then and then uh, I got into the publishing thing a bit, you know. I signed up with a publisher in New York and recorded a an album for at the Decca Studios for Sire Records and that was in 1970 I think and then and then uh, after that I did one for Adelphi which is getting reissued uh, I got a call from them they're gonna reissue that one along with some stuff that didn't come out on a second album and they didn't get released so they'll put some of those cuts on there I think and then, uh, and then I then I went through a long period where I didn't record a number of years and then but did eventually sign with Flying Fish for two did two records for them. 
and then uh, the Red House stuff. Now the Red House stuff, the first two were actually recorded for an Austrian company who sent me a contract. I never met them. I signed them without ever having spoken them to them directly. And uh, and Red House was interested in me, so I asked them if they would license those. So they had to license those two, and then I signed with them after that for three. And two of those have come out, and there's one more. Yeah, baby, yeah. No, baby, no. Yes, baby, yes, I said no. I think he's the most brilliant writer on the scene. It's always a tragedy that uh, the folk music world classifies people. Uh, he's a blues man, you know, and the other ones are singer-songwriters. I never know what they're saying about. Uh, my, the one that, uh, whenever I'm talking about Paul, I say, uh, you talk about a love song, got something got to be arranged. That's a love song. There ain't no fooling around. There ain't no pussyfooting around what he's got to say. I mean, he says it, and sometimes it's, maybe it's, it's too harsh and it's too real for the folksters to uh, really understand what it's about, you know? I love the way you look, little girl. I love the way you smell. I can't get over the taste of your love driving me to hell. Please, baby, please. My love for you won't change. Locked in my heart, you hold the key. Something gotta be arranged. Something gotta be arranged. tradition and the jazz tradition and I, I like to continue that. I do try to incorporate uh, my political views into that type of songwriting. And I think, yeah, the, the country blues tradition and the, and, and the stuff that I'm interested in does hinder songwriting in the sense that, in the sense that it's more difficult to write a song that, that is a continuation of that tradition than it is to write what might be considered the typical singer-songwriter type of a thing. It's, it's a multifaceted type of writing, you know. It requires, uh, to my way of feeling, a song that I can feel proud of that is an extension of the tradition, in my opinion, or an attempt on my part to do that. And it has a lot of standards to, a lot of standards to live up to. And, and, and I'm concerned with language. I don't like to, uh, I don't, I am not a, a sharecropper. I'm not. I'm not someone who's dealing with the, with the uh, politics of the 1920s and 30s. Um, but there are. There's a certain essence of that style that I think, that I try to capture. I'm not saying it's essential, and that you know, the songs that don't deal with that are not acceptable or not appealing to me. But that's. I, but I have tried to do that on numerous occasions. Is c convey a certain feeling. From that, from the old days, the blues is a kind of thing where it's kind of like it's kind of like playing uh, tennis or something. There's, there are there are lines, you know. There was there there are there are boundaries. You can't just you know you don't just get get there and improvise way the hell out of the boundaries. Blues is one of the things about it is it does have limit limitations in terms of structure. 
Watch. Some people think that this, and I don't argue with them. I think that this whole globalization might might, might also be uh, described as Americanization. Some people will think it's going to destroy the identity of some foreign countries. You know, but uh, I guess I guess all I got to do is say no. And I, I say no. I try to keep it out of my life as best I can. But anyway, it's uh, just basically a put down of corporate greed and uh, what it can do to us. I think I've accomplished what I want to say politically and uh, in very few songs. But I, but I think that they're very strong political political statements. And, I've, and I think it's important to me that I was able to do that. But I'm not an issuist songwriter. I, d I don't feel compelled to write a song about every issue that, that bugs me, because if that was the case, I'd be on stage all night singing songs about the things that piss me off, you know, because there's just so damn much of it. You know? I to find a hoodoo man to take a trip with me Across this land from sands of sand And cure all the ills that be But if I climb the highest mountain Looked as far as I could see I never find a hoodoo doctor That was the likes of Franklin D and the things that used to matter don't mean much anymore when the ease of the disease is more seductive than the cure. The power brokers point their fingers at all, but not themselves. With their mirrors turned face to the wall, the big lie they can sell to all our suckers born. Every minute you might think of what's on sale. Don't think too loud or talk too much of the brown hogs that bring the mail and the things that use the mind don't mean much anymore when the ease of the disease is more seductive than a cure. And all I hear like is jingle, jingle, north and south and east and west. Don't worry, they say about right or wrong, just keep thinking the old Right in the shadows of Miss Lovely, who still stands without rest. Another homeless victim cries, one last gasp of freedom's breath. And the things that used to matter don't mean much anymore. When the ease of the disease is more seductive than the cure. Millions who would her realize their dreams Not quelled by ocean hardships Or tyrants rage and screams And the things that used to matter Don't mean much anymore When the ease of the disease Is more seductive than you Jackie Frost, Miss Lily, still stands facing towards the sea. If she saw what went on behind her back, she'd forsake you and me. Say, where's your guts and soul? Take care of your own. Clean up your own back, y'all. If it's a fight you want, there's one idea. The easy time's so hard, and I wonder just how much our country will endure. And which will prove more deadly the disease or the cure. I could find a hoodoo man to take a trip with me Across this land from sand to sand And cure all the ills that be But if I climb the highest mountain Look as far as I could see I'd never find a hoodoo doctor That was the likes of Franklin D And the things that used to matter Don't mean much anymore When the ease of the disease Is more seductive than cure
Way up north of Boston in the sleet and snow Way up in the woods where the highways go There's a country cabin that we all know It's a swinging pad of Henry David Thoreau A cat who learned to read and write so well He could transcendentally just judge like ringing a bell Cry and go, go Henry David, go Flowers and the trees, humming to the rhythm of the birds and bees. And everybody from miles around, they used to wonder who was that crazy clown. He never got uptight about a government job. He was a swinging his transcendental laden Cadillac. Crying gold, go Henry David, go. I know I'm not, in quotes, successful as far as uh, the American uh, idea or at least the modern idea of what success is. But on the other hand, neither was my uh, father, neither was my grandfather, um, neither was any of the great uh, musical uh, people, most of them that I met and who inspired me. None of those guys were really, quote, successful in the, in the in the materialistic sense of the word, either. Um, but if I can make a living and uh, feel as though I'm, and be honest with myself about about what I think I'm accomplishing, uh, in turn, artistically, and, and not just try to fool myself into thinking that I'm playing a role, but actually doing something and contributing something, as long as I feel like I'm really contributing something. Um, then I'm not, I'm not concerned about what the idea of the common idea of success is. I'm going to do an old song. This one goes way back. It's, a, it's a girl, probably one of the earlier blues songs that I've ever uh, heard. And one of them, it's one of those that got recorded in Georgia by a guy named Peg Leg Howell, and it's called the Skin Game Blues. Skin game is a card game. It's uh, similar to uh, they used to call it Georgia skin game or Georgia skin. It's a card game similar to blackjack, fast, fast card game. And there's two, there's verses in this song that go back uh, that I've heard in ballads, like the the rolling gambler has some, has some of the lyrics in the song. So it's a pretty old number.
It's a very subjective kind of thing, you know. I mean, it's, everybody has a different idea about what love is, or what, or a different. Uh, if, you, if you're in love with a woman, uh, you have a totally different view of her than uh, than anybody else does. And uh, usually, I know, at least you would hope so. <laughs> but I mean, that's how I feel about the music. You know, it's kind of, it kind of, it it, it fills, it fulfills uh, a certain requirements that I have in my life. And, and it's been good to me, and it's uh, kept me alive. Uh, which is, I mean, you can't deny the fact that finding a source of income, something to keep you alive that you enjoy doing, is uh, is, is, a, is a very worth, worthwhile thing in any during any century or any time period in history. You have to set your priorities and decide what's most important to you. And the music has been more truthful to me and more supportive to me than any human being, so <laughs> there you go. <laughs> friends 
all up and down the line That's what makes traveling so easy Muchas gracias. Hope to see you sometime again. Happy Christmas and New Year holidays and all that. So take it easy. Let's go.